So today our mathematician spotlight is Harrison Bray. Here's a picture of Harry. Um, he's a postdoc at the University of Michigan. Um, he did his undergrad at Hamilton College, a small liberal arts college much like Swarthmore, um, and his PhD at Tufts University. So chosen today because Tufts is in Boston. It's actually in Medford, but it's basically in Boston. So it's a Boston day, Marathon Monday. Happy Patriots Day. Um, Harry studies geometric structures and geodesic flows. And he, I'm studying with him uh, the first inset, which is a set in the complex plane and has absolutely beautiful pictures. So I thought I'd show those to you. So this is the first inset. Isn't it beautiful? So it's kind of a fattened version of the unit circle. The unit circle goes through all these holes and then it's kind of a fattened version. So what it is is there's this family of polynomials that we care about for some reason. It's a really big family, actually an infinite family of polynomials. And maybe you know if you have a polynomial like, like, like x squared plus 1 equals 0, um, it has solutions in the complex plane, in general in the complex plane. Could be real, but could be complex. So every polynomial of degree n has n solutions, which are points in the complex plane. This is the complex plane. So we take all of our polynomials that we care about, and we plot their solutions in the complex plane. And I color them according to some way of coloring. Um, and we get these amazing pictures. Let's see. Can you see them well enough? I mean, I feel like we should just turn off all the light. Ah, not that one. Whoa, 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 whoa. OK. Got a little overzealous over here. OK, so this is a picture of the Thurston set. And check out what happens if we zoom in. So down here, you can see there's sort of these tree things coming, coming up. Let's see them a little bit better. Check that out. Isn't it so beautiful? So this has really complicated fractal structure. Doesn't it look like there are levels here? Like it's sort of behind the other thing, but it's just the density of points. Um, here's a related set. So this is like a, a fatter, more spread out version of going around the unit circle. Here the unit circle, you can even kind of see it. It's like it's left a little track. Um, and if we zoom in on this thing, So cool, right? So I played with this for a long time until I got the colors just the way I like them. But we want to understand the structure of these things because it's so cool. Um, if you use the entire infinite set of polynomials and all of their solutions, all these, all these holes would fill in. But they seem to be filling in in this kind of pinwheel fashion, which is really cool. Um, and here's just another one for a, a related set. You can see that around these points, there's this cool structure of how the blue and red points fill in. Um, so that's a, that's a really neat project. I mean, it's, the math is cool, but it's motivated by how beautiful the pictures are and wanting to understand them. So this is something that Harry is working on and something that I'm working on with Harry. So, yeah. All right. Might as well put the shades up. It's dark enough outside. OK. So over the past uh, couple of days, we've been talking about vector line integrals um, and how to compute them. And last time we talked about Green's theorem. So today we'll c continue talking about vector line integrals and um, a new technique, which is seeing if your vector field is conservative. So this is a great thing to talk about today. Um, I think it's a bit windy outside. Maybe it's less windy than it was, but in Boston, at least, there's a huge wind. There's a 30 mile per hour headwind on those runners. So it's very windy today. And you might wonder, suppose it's windy out and you want to walk somewhere, like you want to walk from here to the dining hall. Is the wind going to help you or hurt you on your walk? And that's a vector line integral, because the wind is like a vector field and your walk, your walking path, is a curve that you're integrating over. So very, very useful. Um, so I thought we'd start with an example of uh, where Green's theorem can go wrong if you're not careful. So this is like Green's theorem danger zone if you're not careful. So here we go. So compute the vector line integral over the curve C, which is the unit circle oriented counterclockwise, so the usual way we do the unit circle, of um, negative y dx plus x dy over x squared plus y squared. So, so let's draw a picture. So this vector field, um, f, if you write it out, is negative y over x squared plus y squared comma x over x squared plus y squared. 
So let's try to plot what this looks like. Um, actually, you might notice it's just negative y comma x. That's one of our favorite vector fields. That's the vector field that just goes around counterclockwise. But in this case, we've divided by the length of the vector. So it's the vector field that goes around counterclockwise, but all the vectors have length 1. So I'll draw that. So we go around counterclockwise, but all of our vectors have length 1. So these are the ones on the axes, and then the ones going around are also length 1. So these are all supposed to be length 1. If mine are a little bit off of unit length, I apologize, but you get the idea. OK, so there's our vector field, f. And then we have our unit circle oriented counterclockwise. I'll draw that in. Here it is. So there's our unit circle, C, oriented counterclockwise. OK, let's figure out what we should get as an answer. So do you think that this vector field, it, integral, vector line integral, should come out positive, negative, or 0? Hmm? Positive? Zero? Positive? Can you say about why you say positive? Yeah, the vector field is going the same direction as the direction of the path. If you're walking along this path, like to the dining hall or whatever, um, it would be, you would have a tailwind. The wind would be on your back the whole time. So you'd feel like it was helping you. So we should expect a positive um, answer. OK, let's do it. So one way we could do it is, so option 0 is always to just um, parameterize the curve the curve, and compute it. So you could totally do that. And actually, we'll see that as a good solution. Uh, but another thing you could do is um, apply Green's theorem. So Green's theorem, let's see, we did that the last time. We said if you have an oriented curve, you can change it into an area integral over the region inside. So Green's theorem says that under certain conditions, um, the line integral over some curve C of p dx plus q dy is the same as the double integral over a, a region of partial with respect to q of x, partial with respect to x of q, sorry, minus partial with p with respect to y dA. And when we call it like this, then C is the boundary of D. So let's replace this with boundary of D. Um, and where the boundary of D is oriented so that D is on the left. So you can think of that as meaning, please orient it counterclockwise. But sometimes that's a bit tough to see whether something is counterclockwise. So you can just imagine walking along this curve with your left arm out and make sure that your left arm is over the domain inside. So I believe it is. So here's our, our region D. So let's try to do this. So let's apply Green's theorem. So in Green's theorem, we need the partial of Q with respect to X and the partial of P with respect to Y. So here P is all the stuff that's multiplied by DX. So negative Y over X squared plus Y squared. And so if you wanted to take the partial of p with respect to y, well, let's see. There's a y in the top and a y in the bottom. So we'd have to use the quotient rule. OK? So I'm going to eliminate, I'm going to omit the steps. But we would get y squared minus x squared over the denominator squared. And we have q. Our q function is all the stuff that's multiplied by dy. So x over x squared plus y squared. And if we took the partial derivative of this with respect to x, maybe I'll put this down here where you can see it better, it's y squared minus x squared over x squared plus y squared. OK, so I, I omitted the step where I apply the quotient rule, but I suppose that you could do this. So by Green's theorem, um, the vector line integral over the boundary, which is our curve C, of p dx plus q dy, the thing that we want, is the double integral over d of q 
Q sub x minus P sub y. Okay, let's do it. Q sub x, partial of Q with respect to x, is this thing. And then what we want to subtract off partial of Q with respect to y, which is this thing. You see that they are the same? So these are the same. So Q sub x minus P sub y, dA, is just the double integral over D of 0, dA, which is 0. Well, this is highly unexpected because going around the curve, we always had the vector field at our back. It was always helping us. And we got zero. It's very bad. Something has gone wrong. Um, and the thing that has gone wrong is that we didn't check all the hypotheses of Green's theorem. So Green's theorem, you can only apply it when your vector field is continuous everywhere that you care about. Green's theorem um, only applies when um, P and Q, the components of your vector field, are continuous on, the, on your curve C and the region inside. So continuous. This is, this is something that we have studied. We studied whether a function was continuous, for instance, as you approach the origin. It's continuous if you, as you approach the origin if no matter which way you approach the origin, you kind of get the same answer for the function, the same value. So let's see what happens here. If I approach the origin from the right, all of my vectors are just pointing up. They're like, these vectors are like 0, 1. They're just pointing up. So they would say if you approach the origin from the right, you're going to get a vector pointing up. On the other hand, if you approach the origin from the left, all these vectors are pointing down. These are 0, negative 1. So if you approach the origin from the left and the right, you get different answers. And it's not like they're shrinking to 0. They are unit vectors. And the same thing actually from any direction. Right around the origin, vectors point in um, all different directions. So it's not continuous at the origin, because what would the value be at the origin? Who knows? There's nearby vectors are pointing in all the directions, like a pinwheel shape. So um, RF equals negative y over x squared plus y squared, comma x over x squared plus y squared is not continuous at 0, the origin. So Green's theorem doesn't apply on C this unit circle that we were using. Um, on the other hand, if you wanted to use some other curve, like, for example, um, this B-shaped Boston curve over here, no problem, because the vector field is continuous all over here. There's no dividing by 0. All good over here. But if you're going to do anything in closing the origin, you can't just naively apply your in zero. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. If you took this circle and you shifted it somewhere else, you could totally apply Green's theorem, as long as it didn't close the origin, because the origin is where things go wrong. So can you do that and get the same answer and apply it to the circle at the origin? Can you do that and get the same answer and apply it to the circle at the origin? Well, if we took this, if we, if, so instead of walking around the origin, suppose you walk around in a circle out here. Right, The vector field is doing something different out here. It's generally going, whatever, no, northwest. So I would think that the vector line integral will be closer to zero out here because everything's kind of going the same way. It hurts you on one side, it helps you on the other. Over here, though, everything's, the wind is at your back. Yeah. Yeah, if the point, if the bad point where things go wrong is on your curve, um, I believe you also cannot apply Green's theorem. Because things go, uh, it could be, the problem could be, probably here it would be okay because the direction is the problem. Um, I'm not sure though. I'm not, I, I wouldn't apply it. Um, but it's also possible that your vector field could blow up, get really big there, and then it certainly won't. Yeah. Like if this had been x to the 10th plus y to the 10th, 
value gets really big. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the, the answer here is the length of the curve, because it's always a unit vector in the same direction as where you're going. So the actual answer should be 2 pi. Yeah. Good call. Yeah. Yeah, good point. All right. All right. So that's a situation uh, where you shouldn't use Green's theorem because it doesn't apply uh, when something goes wrong at the origin. Um, but you, I, this one, I think you could just parameterize the circle and co compute it, and I think that, that would be the way to go. This particular one. Yeah. Okay. So you might think, okay, I see that we, if we have a vector line integral, one of the options is to use turn it into an, an area, a region integral using Green's theorem. But not all of the curves we've thought about are closed. Like one of the curves we integrated over was like you go to the right by two units and then you go up by two units, and there's no region enclosed there. I would love to be able to use Green's theorem, but just doesn't seem to apply. Um, so one technique we can use is to close off our curve and then apply Green's theorem. So you can close off a curve to apply Green's theorem. Okay. So that's what we'll talk about now. So suppose, for example, you have this vector field, uh, which is super complicated in certain ways. So for instance, you might have x, y squared plus x squared comma x squared y plus x minus y to the power sine of e to the y. OK, that is your vector field. Sorry, the wind is blowing kind of weird today. It's like that. And our curve um, is the top of the unit circle oriented counterclockwise as usual. So here's our picture. And our curve is uh, this part here. So there it is. C. It just goes from there to there. OK, so option one is always just parameterize it and do it. So we could parameterize C. So we would say x of t is cos t, y of t is sine t, because that gives us a unit circle going around. But check this out. If you plug this in for y, you plug in sine of t for y, then you're going to get something that's like sine of t to the power sine of e to the sine of t. And then you're going to have to integrate it with respect to t. That's going to be bad. So we don't want to integrate this. Um, and so Green's theorem, when you use Green's theorem, you use the curl of a vector field. Uh, and so it's the partial derivative with respect to x of the second part minus the partial derivative with respect to y of the first part. Check this out. If you take the partial derivative with respect to x of the second part, this whole horrible y thing goes away. So we'd love to be able to use Green's theorem. So we want to use Green's theorem so that um, you know, qx um, eliminates uh, the bad part. OK, that's sort of our motivation for wanting to use Green's theorem. But this curve is not closed. Like, what's the area enclosed? There is no area enclosed. Green's theorem only applies to a closed curve. So the trick is to close it off, compute the, use Green's theorem, use the area inside, and then subtract off the part that you added. So the idea is to close off, um, a, close off the curve close off C with a curve, say, C1, and then um, use Green's theorem, and then subtract off the vector line integral over C1. So the idea is, OK, let's draw in the curve that we need. OK, 
So you could add in any curve that you want. For instance, I could just close it off with the bottom of the unit circle, but then I'd run into the same problem because I still have this, this issue with y being sine t. And so when I integrate c1 over the bottom, I'd have a bad time. So um, let's make c1 go across here and see if it works. You could do anything. You could go zigzagging. You could go, I don't know, you could go far away. Um, then you'd have to change your orientation. Anyway, there you go. And then um, our region enclosed will be this top half of the unit circle bit, which we'll call D. Um, and, and let's check that the orientation is correct. So if we're walking along this curve, I believe that the region enclosed is on our left. That's all good. Um, we should check that the vector field is continuous everywhere that we care about. Um, actually, it's continuous everywhere because it's a, a, a sum and difference and composition of continuous functions. So I think we can apply Green's theorem. It's all good. So the idea is that um, Green's theorem says that the vector line integral over C plus C1, like the whole bounding curve of F dot T ds, is the same as the double integral over the interior. Oh, I should call this uh, P sub PDX plus QDY. Is the double integral of the partial derivative of Q with respect to X minus the partial derivative of Q with respect to Y dA. And that this part on the left, well, the vector line integral over both curves together is just the vector line integral over C plus the vector line integral over C1. Just integrate over one, integrate over the other. Now this C is the one that we want, so this tells us that the vector line integral over C of this PDX plus QDY is this guy, the double integral over D of this curl vector, QX minus PY DA minus this part. So the integral over C1 of PDX plus QDY. So that's what we do. We do the um, the Green's theorem integral over the region inside, and we subtract off the line integral over C1, and that gives us what we want. This is what we want. This is Green's theorem part. And this we hope we can compute directly. So we're still leaving ourselves with a vector line integral to do, but we're hoping the C1 one is going to be easier. So let's try it. So let's compute the parts. Let's do the Green's theorem part. So we want the double integral over d of partial of q with respect to x minus partial of p with respect to y dA. Okay, let's compute this. So in this case, q is the second part of our function. So x squared y plus x minus y something 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 involving y. So the partial of q with respect to x is 2xy plus 1. Okay? And then we have p, which is, uh, 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 and then this y part goes away because it's just a function of y. This p is the first part of our vector field, so xy squared plus x squared. So partial of p with respect to y is 2xy plus 0. So the double integral over d of partial of q with respect to x, that's 2xy plus 1, minus partial of p with respect to y, that's 2xy dA. Uh, the two xy's cancel out, we get just the double integral over d of 1 dA, which is the area of d. Now we have to compute that. Yeah, pi, it's, so if it was a whole disk, q to disk, the area would be pi, and it's only half of that. So it's pi over two. Great. All right. So we know the first part here. Now we know this is pi over two. Okay. Now for C1, um, there are two ways you could do this, at least two ways. Um, you could just parameterize the curve. It's just along the x-axis, so it would be something like x of t equals t, y of t equals zero. Um, or you could try the, the clever way that we've seen where if things are horizontal or vertical, you can just figure out the line integral directly. So along C1, 
It's along the x-axis, so y is 0. So our vector field, if we plug in 0 here for y, we just get x squared for the first component. And then if we plug in 0 for y in the second one, we just get x. So it's just x squared comma x. And then our, tangent, our unit tangent vector in the direction that we're going, well, we're always going to the right. So it's just 1, 0. And then our ds is just dx, because we're always moving in the x direction. So uh, the integral over c of p dx plus q dy, it's just another way of saying the integral over c of f, c1 in this case, dot t ds. So it's the integral of f, which is x squared comma x, dot t, which is 1, 0, ds, which is dx. And we want to use the x's that we're interested in. x on the left side of the circle is negative 1. And x on the right is 1. So we go from x equals negative 1 all the way up to 1. Um, so this is the integral from negative 1 to 1 of x squared plus 0. So x squared dx. So it's x cubed over 3. Plug in both things. You get 2 thirds. So there we go. So that wasn't so bad. It turns out we were able to do that one directly, no problem. So this one is 2 thirds, and we want to subtract it. So the thing that we want, the line integral over c of f dot t ds is pi over 2 minus 2 thirds, which is positive. So the vector field helps us on our journey. Why would that give us the same answer, regardless of what curve we use to close the region? So it, 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 it would give us the same answer no matter which curve we used. So, so because uh, Green's theorem takes into consideration where the curve is. So for instance, if you had chosen to do your curve to be the, just the bottom half of the unit circle, then Green's theorem would be the entire interior of the unit disk. So it would compensate for that. Okay. It's kind of like. When you slide your curve along your area, it somehow takes into consideration what kind of function it's sliding. Yeah. Other questions or ideas? OK. OK, so to recap, um, we have a couple of strategies for computing vector line integrals. So um, option zero is uh, to parameterize the curve and compute it. Um, using the, so we would just do from t equals wherever we're interested in at the beginning to t equals wherever we're interested at the end of our vector field um, as a function of our parameterization x of t dot our direction vector x or our velocity vector x prime of t dt. Just do it. You can always just do it. Sometimes you might get an integral that you can't do, like in this case, but you can always try. Um, another option is to, um, if the curve is horizontal, or vertical, um, simplify f and t um, and see if you can get some simple integral to do, just like we did down here for c1. Um, another option is that you can use Green's theorem. So if your curve is closed and your uh, region, your vector field is continuous inside, you can use Green's theorem and you might possibly need to close it off, as we have just seen. Um, so far, so good. Um, and now we'll see a new thing. So another third option, so that's a new option, is to um, see if your vector field 
is actually the gradient vector field for some function f. And apply the upcoming fundamental theorem of vector line integrals. So this is a new, a new thing that we'll do. So, so I'll write it up. Um, the fundamental theorem of vector line integrals. So it's not every day that you see a fundamental theorem of something, of anything, really. So the fundamental theorem of calculus, perhaps you remember? Fundamental theorem of calculus says, if you want to know something about a function on an interval, oh, you just take its antiderivative, you plug it in at the end, and you subtract off what it was at the beginning. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus. How about some other ones? Fundamental theorem of algebra. Does anybody know what it is? I actually mentioned it at the beginning when talking about Harry Bray. Um, it says, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Every polynomial has a number of roots equal to its degree. Nice. So if you have like a cubic polynomial, a degree three polynomial, it's going to have three roots in the complex plane. Nice. Great. How about the fundamental theorem of arithmetic? Anybody know what it is? It says that any um, whole positive number has unique factorization into primes. So if I say 15, factor it into primes. 5, 3, 1, 15. 5 times 3. It has to be primes. One is in the prime. Five, three. Yep. Five and three. Factor fifteen. Five and three. Factor fifteen. Yeah, five and three or three and five. Yeah. If any, if you know, and I gave you a number that I knew you could factor. Um, but if I gave you more bigger numbers, you would factor them, and you'd all get the same thing. Maybe your primes would be in a different order, but you get the same factorization into primes. Yep. Okay. So the fundamental theorem of line integrals is very much like um, the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if it says if your vector field f is the gradient vector field um, for some um, function, it could be a function of two variables, x and y, or some function of three variables, x, y, z, etc., then um, the vector line integral over any curve c of f dot t ds well, that's just the vector line integral over c of the gradient of little f dot t ds. Here, I didn't, I didn't do anything. I just changed f to its other name, gradient of little f, is just little f at the end minus little f at the start. That's it. It just says, if you want to know what the function is like along the curve, you just figure out what the the little f function is at the end and subtract off what it is at the start. And so that I have some way of referring to this little function, this little function f is called a potential function for f. And here I don't mean like, oh, f, maybe it could be a function for f, like potentially, maybe. No, f is a potential function, like, like electric potential in physics. So, or, or uh, gravitational potential. You can think of it as like um, your elevation on a mountain and then gradient of f just is the gradient vector field that says which, which way to climb most steeply. And in this case, when at big F is the uh, gradient vector field for some potential function f, we say that f is conservative. It's a conservative vector field. And again, that's... Um, because of things like conservation of energy in physics. Yeah. Does C have to be closed? Nope. C does not have to be closed. C could be any curve. Yeah. Yeah. Question? Do you have a theory about the curl of big F? Is it in the gradient Yes. Is zero? Yes. We have a theory about the curl of big F when it is a gradient vector field. The curl of a gradient vector field is always zero. Is that right? I believe we've proved that. That's what it was. Is that what it was? Curl of a gradient vector field always zero? Yeah, OK. So a curl of a conservative vector field is always zero. Is that true? Is that true? Yeah, that's all true. OK, good, good, OK. So. Let's see a, a situation where this would be super useful. Okay. okay. So, 
as we have noted, it is possibly windy outside today. And as we have not noted yet, but I'm about to, perhaps you are hungry and you wish to go to the dining hall. And so you're going to go to the dining hall. So, so uh, let's say F is as before, the same uh, vector field as before. Uh-oh. Wait. Nope. I don't have it as before because we haven't talked about it. So let's say F is, it'll be slightly different from the one before. So this is the wind that's going outside. So e to the y plus y squared plus 1, comma, x e to the y plus 2xy plus cosine of y. So it's very blustery outside. This is the, the vector field. Um, this is the wind vector field outside. And you are located in room 104, which is at 1, comma, 4 here. And you are wishing to go to the um, Sharples Dining Hall, S here. So we'll call that 5, comma, 0. Um, and it is, if, even if it's not windy outside, there's a lot of rain, right? I noticed on my walk here that the track was already flooded out to lane 6. That's quite a lot. So anyway, everything's flooding in Swarthmore. So when you walk to the dining hall, you can't just walk directly there, plus there are buildings in the way. So maybe you take some sort of circuitous path to avoid the puddles. So there's your curve C. And you want to know, if I take this circuitous path, avoiding the puddles, what is the gradient over my, over my path of f dot t ds? Is the wind helping me or hurting me? Inquiring minds want to know. OK, so let's review our methods of computing a vector line integral. First, just do it. Parameterize the curve and compute it. Can't do it because we don't have equations for this curve. OK, check if our curve is horizontal or vertical because then maybe things will become easier. Nope. Too bad you guys don't move like an Etch-a-Sketch. Life's would be much easier if you did. OK, third thing, um, Green's theorem. Close off the thing, integrate over the region inside. Probably not going to work either, because even if we were able to close it off, we wouldn't have a curve for the region inside. It would be hard to parameterize. So the only hope that we have is that f is actually a conservative vector field, because then we can use the fundamental theorem of line integrals and just do f of the end minus f of the beginning. OK, so we hope f is conservative so we can compute just a little f of the end minus little f of the start, because that would be great. So let's try to find a potential function for big F. So we want to try to find a potential function so that the gradient of f, which is parcel of f with respect to x, comma parcel with respect to, to y, is our big vector field f. Okay, so let's just see. So that would mean that the parcel of f with respect to x is this first component, e to the y plus y squared plus 1. And the parcel of f with the little f with respect to y is the second part, x e to the y plus 2xy plus cosine of y. OK, so if you like, you can just guess and check. So you can just say, oh, I'm guessing maybe the function is this, and then just take the derivative with respect to x, take the derivative with respect to y, see if they match. Perfectly good way of trying to do it. Um, 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 a slightly more systematic way is integrate each, each one with respect to their variable, and then try to match them up. So if we take the antiderivative of this thing with respect to x, it tells us that f of xy would be something like, OK, this is a constant with respect to x. So this would be e x e to the y. This is also a constant with respect to x. So this would be x y squared. This would integrate to x, and then plus a constant. But this constant, it could actually be a function of y. Because if we took the derivative of this thing with respect to x, and there was a function purely of y, it would also go away. So it could be plus any function of y. Let's do the same thing over here, <coughs> integrate with respect to y. It tells us that f of x, y is something like, OK, antiderivative e to the y with respect to y, just e to the y. So x e to the y 
Integrative of 2xy with respect to y is xy squared. Integrative of cosine of y with respect to y is sine of y. And then possibly some function of x. Who knows? OK, let's try to match them up and see if it worked out. So we have x e to the y over here and x e to the y over there. Happy? We have xy squared over here and xy squared over there. Happy? Um, we have x over here. And over here, we said we're allowed to have a function of x, so that makes sense. Um, and then over here, we have a sine of y, and we're allowed to have a function of y. So good. So this tells us that f of xy is x e to the y plus xy squared plus x plus sine of y, plus any constant that you want, but we don't need no sense having a constant, is a potential function. for f. So f is conservative. Yes. Yay. So not politically conservative, just physics conservative. Yeah, OK. OK, so let's compute this thing. I mean, it could be politically conservative, but it's hard to define, not well defined. So this tells us that the vector line integral over C, which is our path from here to the dining hall, avoiding all of the puddles, of f dot t ds is, well, that's the same as the integral over C of gradient of f dot t ds for this f that we so happily just found, um, which is f of the end minus f of the start. So that's f of Sharples, 5 comma 0, minus f of room 104, so 1 comma 4. And so now we just have to plug it in. So f of 5 comma 0, that's this function, this f right here, our potential function, when you plug in these things. So this is maybe a little bit challenging, but not nearly as challenging as integrating over that curve c if it's not defined. So, OK, so we have to plug in 5 comma 0. I'm stalling. I'll now just get down to business. So 5 times e to the 0 plus 5 times 0 squared plus 5 plus sine of 0. OK, so that's the value of the function where you end. Subtract off the value of the function where you start. So f of 1 comma 4 is 1 times e to the 4th plus 1 times 4 squared plus 1 plus sine of 4. OK, so I did that to, to just show you what it means to plug in the function, the showing endpoints into the function. And if you multiply this out and cancel things, I guess we get something like 7 minus e to the 4th minus sine of 4. So this is a negative number. It tells you that on your path to the dining hall, the wind will be working against you. It will be more in your face than it is at your back. Sorry. Much like the Boston Marathon runners who are running into a 30 mile per hour headwind the entire way from Hopkinton to Boston. Is it running 30 miles per hour or is it just because they're, they're running against it that it feels 30 miles per hour? The weather channel weather is 30 miles per hour. And let's see, they're going between five and six minutes per mile, so between 10 and 12 miles per hour. So they're experiencing a 40, approximately 40 mile per hour headwind. That's why you draft behind someone else, because you turn your 40 mile an hour headwind into just like a little blusteriness on the edges. And somebody else you're losing, Well, you're not losing by much. It's a marathon. You're losing by like a meter. It's going to be OK. Yeah, you, when the, the finish line comes into view, just pull out to the side. Go. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So let's see, as a final thing, you might wonder what about if you are not quite so ambitious as to do a marathon, but you're thinking, I'll just go over to the track and uh, do a 10,000 meters. So, so how about we use the same F, the same as before, because it's still windy here in Swarthmore. And C is um, 25 counterclockwise laps of the track. Um, I think probably by now the track is flooded, so these could be choose your own adventure. They could be running laps, they could be swimming laps. It's up to you. Um, so let's do this. So here's the track. Um, and C 
is this curve uh, times 25. So I'm not going to draw it 25 times, but you get the idea. You have to go around 25 times, 25 times 400, 10,000. Good. So let's do it. So, um, yep, line integral over C of f dot t ds. This is a different C, I guess. This is C, C 10k, C 10k, OK? Um, so it's just, that's the, it's, f is still conservative. So this is the integral of the, vec of the gradient of f dot t ds. And since f is conservative, this is f of the end minus f of the start. And you don't even have to know where you end and start. You end and start right here. Uh, but it doesn't matter because you end and start in the same place. So f of n, so this is the same as f of start minus f of start because you start and end in the same place, which is 0. So if you're, if you're doing a closed loop over a conservative vector field, the line integral is 0. Um, and one way to think about this is a conservative vector field. You can think about it as you have like a mountain and the the vector field tells you which way to climb most steeply. And if you do any path on the mountain, you come back to where you started, you come back to the same elevation. So the net change of your elevation is zero. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.